Welcome to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com, dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. Serving leaders, managers, and people who will be, helping you reach excellence in your work and achieve your personal goals at the same time. Sign up for the free course at clearandopen.com. The top 10 things that successful people do that you should do too. Why you should do this. It's all the one, not the zero. And people want that because they already have a preset orientation of looking for the one rather than the zero. But what if the answer is in the zero? Hi, it's Joseph, and thanks for tuning in to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com. In our increasingly noisy world, an industry has popped up selling silence by the hour through things like sensory deprivation tanks and a variety of meditation practices. These can be very useful tools or they can be shortcuts, but that silence is always there. It's the canvas on which our experiences are painted. Over the next four episodes, I'm going to explore the power of abiding with that silence and how you can start accessing it whenever you want. I offer weekly member webcasts, online courses, and mentorship at clearandopen.com because it's my truth that with the right tools, anyone can eliminate the people, money, and time problems holding them back in business. And I share parts of these webcasts and courses on this show because I want to help you too. If you're enjoying the show and learning from it, I'd love your feedback. If you're listening to the show on an Apple device, all you have to do is open the podcast app, view the full description of this episode, and click the link to leave a rating and review for the show. Thanks so much for listening. Let's start the show. Friday, I went and did an hour in a float deprivation tank. A a sensory depth tank? Yeah. How was that? I loved it. It was a little too far. I I mean, I'd go every day, I think, but it's a good half hour, 45 minutes drive, Uh and then an hour in the tank and... So now I'm thinking, I'm talking to Jamie, how we you start a new business? <laughs> start one up closer. <laughs> you know, I was just going to say, in, in a world where stimulation is, uh, you know, we're all just maxed out on it, um, sensory deprivation tanks, I would, I would imagine, are going to increase in popularity. There's been noises about those for the last five or ten years. I've been seeing them pop up here and there. Pretty it, cool. was, it was quite the experience. I, I felt... That whole next, the rest of the day, I felt way different than normal. Okay, so it stuck with you. Mm -hmm. Well, trying to get Jamie, but he's always so busy or sick or something. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Well, what if meditation could produce that same result without needing a tank or having to drive to go get one? Because really, what what a sensory deprivation tank is just doing some of the work for you, Mm -hmm. because that stillness. And that silence is there all the time. It's the canvas upon which all of the content of our experience is painted. Right? Every word I say exists in silence. It's like paint on white canvas. The white is the silence, the paint is the word. So the stillness and the silence that you can access and abide with in a sensory deprivation tank that's not not there all the time right it's easy to think well i need to get to that silent space that stillness and of course it's nice to have help but it's not like that silence isn't already there wouldn't it be cool to be able to access that whenever you wanted yeah, I always find. Si- oh, I'm sorry, Tiffany. Go, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Peter. Uh, I always find silence to be louder than the noise. Silence can be very loud. Silence, silence drives me crazy. Mm. I, don't know, I think it's because my thoughts just start racing in a way that it's. Uh, I need. I need the noise to block out the thoughts in my head. That's uh, very honest and very common, Angel. <laughs> where it's a kind of cycle where we are our minds racing and we don't like the thoughts that we're having. So then we seek to 
we gravitate toward noise of some kind, a TV, a radio, talking to people, whatever it is, to kind of beat back the jungle of all of the, uh, in some, uh, my, I had one teacher used to call it uh, chichararo, cockroach noise. Um, because it's like, we just, ah, that all that's distracting. So I'm going to distract myself with something else. So I'm not distracted by this distraction of my mind. Well, now you've got two layers of distraction, you see? And unfortunately, that works. So instead of being distracted by the thoughts that you don't like so much, now you're distracted by something way more pleasant. And that's nice. Could be you eat something, watch something, exercise, could be anything. But it doesn't deal with the root issue, which is... I was going to say which is. I, I, I don't. What well, I don't understand it because I all I can know from my own experience is, for instance, I walk on one of my jobs and there's a radio blaring. The first thing I do is either turn it off or unplug it if I can't find the switch because <laughs> I cannot concentrate on what I want to do there with the damn radio blaring. Mm-hmm. And then you're at an airport and you got this damn talking heads up on the screen while you're sitting there waiting for your plane and wanting to relax and read a book. And so many public spaces have noise going on. It just drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. But maybe what you're saying here is here that I need to see that that silence, that stillness is within me. And if I just access it, I would be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, here's a piece of paper with some writing on it. What do you see? What do you notice that you notice? Writing on paper. Yeah. Black on paper. Yeah. You notice, what do you notice first? Paper. Okay. You notice the paper first. And what do you notice about the paper? It has folds in it and writing on it. Okay. So you see the folds and the writing and maybe the blue lines on the paper. Right. You notice those things first. What, what do you notice last? The white space. Yes. Now, why is that? It's just as prominent and just as there as the pink line. Why is that? Why is there a pink line in the margin and blue lines? Who decided that? Okay, everybody, when we make paper now, it's going to be blue lines going horizontally and this double pink line. On the, it's weird. Right? I hate that. Yeah, I don't like it either. <laughs> What if I want a purple line on the left side and I want... You have to pay $10 more for that kind. Yes, right. For sure. Yeah. Find my paper without the pink vertical line in it. (laughs) That's me. I love your discernment and uh, decisive aversiveness, Peter. So yeah, so notice, we don't know, we notice the white space last. Why is that? Right, Just like when you walk into the room, we walk into any room, you notice the stuff in the room. You don't notice the shape of the space around the stuff. But the, space, the shape of the space around the stuff is just as there as all of the stuff. Right? When you look at the computer screen you're looking at right now, or the phone you're holding in your hand or whatever, you notice the shape of the monitor, the device, you don't notice the shape of the space around it. You see how arbitrary that is in one way? At the risk of being, have being called on using an excuse, I'm going to say that our parents and our teachers ask little kids, oh, what's this thing? Mm. We're, at, we're asked and quizzed because our parents and teachers want us to, they want to be proud of us and they want to tell us certain things they think are important or asking us about those shapes and those things versus what's the not part, the part that's not there. Mm -hmm. I would wager. Yeah, that's for sure part of it. Our parental conditioning contributes to that, societal conditioning. conditioning. And it's not that we don't have the ability to see the space. Like if you're in a crowd and you want to get through it, you look for space, right? You go, oh, there's an opening. Let's go there. You just saw, what did you see? You didn't see something. You saw the absence of something, you recognized it. So it's not like we're incapable of doing that. It's just that we generally don't do it. Maybe we don't see the value of it yet. Mm. 
Yeah, except when you go somewhere through a crowd. Yeah. Or through trees and bushes and brambles. And so in, yeah, so, and in my industry, in the coaching and consulting industry, all you got to do is look at the titles of the blog posts, business, right? Five ways to blah, blah, blah. The top 10 things that successful people do that you should do too. Why you should do this. It's all the one, not the zero. This thing, this thing, get this, do that. And people want that because they already have a preset orientation of looking for the one rather than the zero. But what if the answer is in the zero? Because we're so heavily conditioned to look toward something concrete, tangible. Generally, people's answers are not in that realm because they would have found it already (laughs) because we're just so conditioned to look there. So generally, when I help people solve their problems, it's not in that realm because they've already been barking up that tree for a really long time. So mostly what I do is help people step back and look at the space. What, What is that? What's the zero? Who they're being, how they're thinking, how they've identified the problem. These are the qualities of the canvas, the texture of the paper that the writing is on. Being rather than doing. Things that require you to step outside of yourself and look back and ask questions like, how am I relating to this problem? How am I relating to work? How am I relating to life? What's life trying to tell me about how I need to be, who I need to be to relate to this? That's generally where people's problems are solved. Precisely because we don't want to look there. Because rather than looking at that space, we'd much rather just replace the chicharara, the cockroach noise in our head, with some other kind of distraction. That's the way the mind works. Because the mind is not comfortable with that spaciousness. Well, maybe it's the space that you're in. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. I was in Chile, and we, and we, uh, we were in this apricot farm where they were dry apricots. And we went to the back part of the mountain, and it was like out of a storybook it was like mountains on mountains on mountains it was incredible the view that you could see and the vastness of it and then you could see just how much of a speck you were Mm -hmm. on this entire earth and then i hadn't even gotten high enough to reach the snow cap which is always there in the andes Mm -hmm. it's one of the most beautiful things i've ever seen and then the weather was maybe in the sixties, but just comfortable enough to where you didn't need, really need to, to layer up. It's like perfect. And I sat there for a minute. Now it was just me and some friends, my wife, uh, no kids, no responsibilities, no, no noise whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But I even sat there and kind of distanced myself from my friends and sat there in silence. That silence was great, mm-hmm. but like normal silence, that silence is God awful. That's terrible. That's a really noisy silence. (laughs) So you're talking about the difference between like an awe-inspired, beauty-supported silence and silence that doesn't have that kind of support. Because that scene, beautifully described, by the way, thank you, that scene is like a sensory deprivation tank. It supports your experiencing silence. Because it's beautiful, you know? And so those, that's one of the reasons we like views like that, open views, is because it gives us a meta perspective. It supports us to step outside of ourselves and sort of merge and blend with the infinite by having these big vistas. That's why churches usually have really high ceilings. It's, 
evocative of a sense of the divine. We like big views. That's, you know, a house with a view has a more value than a house without a view. We like that. Why? Because it's meta, it's perspective, it's space. It attends us to that zero rather than the one. And when it's a beautiful, good feeling support for that, it's easier than when you're on a New York subway and the smells are similar to a cat litter box. Yet that spaciousness and that silence is still there. How could it not be? It's just the experience of the New York subway is more likely to stimulate in you a contraction from the content. I don't really like this. I'd rather be somewhere else. Whereas in the foothills of the Andes, you have an expanded like feeling of, oh, this is lovely. This is lovely so I can abide with the root of reality, that spaciousness. This is not lovely. I can't abide with that. You see? But where it happens is in that contraction. Thanks for listening to Manage to Engage, the clear and open podcast. Join us next week when you'll be a little bit closer to who you're destined to be. Until then, know that Clear and Open is dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. If you want to help the show grow, I'd appreciate you leaving a rating and review on iTunes. All you have to do is open the Apple Podcasts app, view the full description of the episode, and click the link to leave a rating and review. Or you can go to clearandopen.com slash review, and it will bring you to the right place. If you're looking for more support on your journey, head over to clearandopen.com for even more tools, articles, and free resources. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now.